tablet. And the reason why you're seeing my tablet is because just based on the tests and the stuff that I have marked, I think it might be a good idea for us to just do a more granular look at Node.js, which I kind of had planned anyways, because it's been a, about a week, almost two weeks since we've actually touched Node. So um, I think it's a good idea for us to kind of go over it and get a better understanding of what we're actually doing with those files. Uh, once we're done that, we'll take a nice little break and then we're going to do some React. This might wind up being a shorter class. It might be only like two hours long um, just because the thing we're doing for React is quite small. I mean, I always say that at the beginning of the class and then it's always like the full class every time and then we have to carry stuff over, but we'll see what happens. All right, uh, if you want to follow along with what I'm doing, um, if you open up the uh, app that we use, uh, the link is under Blackboard. You can go there and you can see lesson eight, I think it is. I think it's lesson eight. Hold on, let me navigate in. <laughs> oh, it's lesson seven, but it's technically eight because it's week eight. But yeah, that's fine. So if you navigate to that and open that up, and the part we're going to be talking about is this first part, which will be our Node.js application workflow. And you'll notice that I've created a little table here to help explain the major five components that we use whenever we're creating a resource. So the five components we use is we create a route, we register the route with our application, we then do, do, do we create a resource model. So if we have a model, if we don't have a model, then we don't need to, but if we have a resource model, we would create a resource model, which is like 90% of the time. And then we create a resource controller, which basically connects our routes to our, um, to our controller actions, right? Um, and also helps us interact with our model and our views. So the controller you can think of as like the center operator that deals with all this. We're gonna talk about this in depth. And then we have our view, right? So there's five steps to creating every resource at the end of the day. It's the resource, it's the routes, register the routes with the application, create a model, create a controller, create a set of views. Five steps every single time. So it's going to change slightly when we get into React because our views are gonna be handled by React, but the process is still the same. You still have those five steps, just now your views, instead of creating your views in the views folder, you'll be creating your views with the React application instead. But we'll talk about that when we, when we hit that point. All right, so I'm going to try to illustrate what happens with the actual user request when we get a user request. So you think of it that like when we actually navigate to our application, um, I don't know if I actually have a blog given up right now. I don't think I have the blog application up. Uh, well, actually, even this application. So this is a Rails app, but I can still use it as an example. So in this app, this is a RESTful application, the same as what we've been building. What we've been building is called RESTful, which stands for represent, representational state transfer. Um, basically, the idea is that in a REST API or in a REST application, we use the path that the user has typed in in order to translate it into actions that we want to commit, right? So um, we can take a look at the path and be able to tell what resource they're trying to access and what particular action they're attempting to do on that resource, whether it's one of the four CRUD operations or something we've done custom, right? So in this particular one that we're looking at here, this one's custom, but Still same idea, lesson plan would be my resource, hard copy just happens to be the action call that I'm doing, and seven, does anybody know what seven would be? Yeah, yeah it's the parameter, it's the bound parameter and it's the identifier of which particular lesson I'm, active, I'm trying to access. If you want to prove that, if you change seven to six, you'll see less than six. If you change it to five, you'll see less than five because it's the bound parameter that tells it which lesson we actually want to look at, right? So RESTful APIs are pretty standard. Um, the other one that's out there is called SOAP, but it's not used as much. Uh, but RESTful APIs are pretty, pretty common. Um, now I say API, but I mean API more as like an application interface. I don't necessarily mean like connecting to Facebook and grabbing your page feed. 
um, that, but that is an API. An API just means that I've given you a way to interact with the resources on this application. That's all that I've done, right? That's what my API is. A way for you to be able to commit some sort of action against my application, okay? So in the app that we've been building, we've created API endpoints. All of our routes, those are nice little endpoints that we have that we can use for doing things like uh, creating a new blog post, reading any of the blog posts that are there, whether we show them all or show only one, um, updating blog posts, and also destroying any blog posts that happens to be there as well. Right. So all of those are our wonderful little API endpoints. And that's kind of important to understand as well because our application is going to change a little bit once we introduce React because instead of um, us routing all of our stuff to views from the controller, we're actually just going to send back JSON responses to React. And then React is going to decipher the JSON response and print it out to the screen in its view. Right? So it will work more like a traditional API like you would if you were to, like, I don't know, reach out to S3 or something in Amazon or do a Facebook post page or something like that and using those API data. So you'll get real strong with how actual APIs kind of work as well. Okay, cool. So the step one that we talk about with creating resources, ba -ba, with creating resource routes. So when our user actually navigates to a path, right? So let's give our user a path here. So we'll say the user is going to HTTPS, and they're going to navigate to, I don't know, we'll just say localhost for now. So your localhost <laughs> won't be usually public facing, right? So we're going to say localhost 4000, and they're going to blogs, okay? So our user enters that. These endpoints, this is the endpoint piece right here, this endpoint basically says to our application, I want to call this action. I want to do this particular action, whatever this endpoint is actually connected to, right? So when we get that with our application, we need to be able to say, okay, what are we going to do with this? Now, when we actually get this into the application, the first place that this winds up going, does anybody know the entry file that it goes to? What's the first file that our request will actually hit in our application? Does anybody know? Not the view, sorry? Not necessarily, but you're definitely on the right track. We didn't call it index, though. We called it something else. Yeah, app.js. So it's going to hit our app.js file, right? App.js is going to take that, and it's going to convert it into two pieces. It's going to convert it into a request, right? It's going to create a request object. Sorry, three pieces. It's going to create a response object, and then it's going to create a next object, which we haven't really explored up to this point. The request object will contain all the information about the user's request. Okay, So this particular request that has happened here will likely be a GET request. Right? Because they want to see all of the blogs that they currently have in the system. So they're doing a GET request. If they were to do a POST request, then the header information would change. But all of that information is going to wind up stored in our request object. The path that they're trying to access and the HTTP method are the two most important pieces there for us, right? So why don't we actually draw our actual request object? So here's our request object, right? And our request object is going to have a path key, which will be equal to the HTTP he asks, actually, sorry, no, it will not. It will be equal to, hey, what happened? There we go. Erasing's kind of annoying. Um, it'll be equal to the slash blogs. And then our method, which will be equal to get. Those will both be stored inside the actual request object that gets passed through our application. All right, the next step our application is going to go to from there, it's going to go through all of those wonderful registered middlewares that we have in place. So that's going to hit the flash middleware that we registered in there. 
It's going to hit the authentication middleware that we created. And anything else that we may have created that I'm not currently remembering. Body parser, all those wonderful things. It's going to hit each one of those. The last place that it's going to hit is the last middleware that we registered, which is our routes. And these are our registered routes. Okay. So let's see how well you followed along with when we were building the application. When it hits the registered routes, what file is it going to go to first from app.js? Does anybody remember? So from app.js, so we're currently accessing blogs, right? It's going to go to this file first. I'll go to the uh, pages route. The, you're thinking pages? No. Blog route. The, the what yeah, routes? Blog routes. Like There's a step before. Routes. Routes, routes. yeah. Routes.js. The reason why it's going to go to the routes.js file is because that's where we're actually registering all of our resource routes. We're building our resource routes under one file, but then we're registering them with our application under routes.js to keep everything nice and clean. So that's going to go to routes.js. Then the next step, after that file, blog routes, exactly. Well, actually, we'll write it down properly because we know where it goes. It goes to routes, blogs.js, right? And you don't have to write this down. I will post this as a PDF online uh, so that you can see it. All right, so that's when we register. So that would be step one and two. So where resource routes are integral to the mapping a user's request to a desired action, the route interprets the requested path, right, just like we were saying here, by using regular expression. So that's what Express is doing. Express uses regular expression to be able to break up the path and decide what you're doing with this particular path, and then it compares it against all of your, um, your routes that you created under your application, right? It compares the, the pattern that you provided. So when you do a pattern of uh, router.get slash blogs, and the user goes to HTTPS localhost colon 4000 blogs, it's taking that path and comparing it to the path that you put inside the routes. When we do blog slash colon ID, we actually are adding a little pattern fuzzy matcher in there that basically says, hey, yeah, you're matching blogs, but do you also match this like fuzzy matcher of colon ID? Do you have an identifier of some sort in there, right? So it matches that pattern, and then we route off to our controller action from there. All right, so we define the routes in a specific route file. We're defining them in our resources routes. Uh, we usually name them in plural format, but you don't have to. It's really up to you what, how you want to name them, but the common convention is to use a plural format. This is purely convention and not required. We could put all of our routes in app.js, which you may see some... Node.js applications where that is the case because the person is super lazy and that's what they want to do. So they literally list all of their routes inside that app.js file. I've seen extremely fat app.js files where there's like, you know, two, three thousand lines of code because they just dump everything in the app.js file. It's gross. It's very hard to maintain, right? Um, we keep them separated to make it easier to work with, right? So. We're not just maintaining, just like the reason why you build functions or classes is for better maintenance and better encapsulation. It's also the reason why you would separate code into different files for better encapsulation and better maintenance, right? Um, each resource file must contain at least a minimum of four parts. So every time we create a new resource file, we always make sure there's four pieces to that. We have the express router library that we require at the top of the file, right? We have a, which we can actually see, do. So here's our resource file, right? And you'll notice at the top here, we have our router equals require express router. That's, that's the first piece. We have to have that component. An imported resource controller file that has been exported, that has exported methods, optional, but a common convention assigned to a logic variable uh, called resource controller. That's the second line here where it says const, Resources controller equals require, and that's our resource controller, right? 
The reason why we do it this way and keep our controller actions in a separated file is once again, it makes better maintainability, but you don't have to. If you look at our routes, like take a look at this first route, for example, where it says router.get slash resources controller dot index. That resources controller dot index is simply a function definition. So for those of you that took the JavaScript intro course, you might remember function definitions. For those of you that did not, a function definition, you can think of it as the code you literally wrote in the syntax editor. It takes that code block and assigns it as a value. It only executes that function when you add the parentheses. That's the only time it gets executed. So what this basically says to the router.get is the slash is the path that I want to match. So this piece right here is what I want to match. And this is the callback function that I want you to execute. So what some people will do, instead of actually having a controller file, they just simply write the callback function and put their logic within there. But once again, that leads to a massive file of logic all within that file and makes it hard to maintain. One other benefit to this is we can actually support something called aliasing. Right? So I have resources controller dot index and that points to slash, right? But if I wanted to, I could also do slash home and point it to the same controller action because our controller action is encapsulated. It's completely abstracted from that logic. Whereas if I did it as a callback inline callback function, I would have to duplicate that code twice, which would be absurd. Or redirect, right? Either way, it would be very confusing to read. All right, so the individual resource routes use a combination of the HTTP method, as I said before, right? So that would be this wonderful thing right there. And a combination of the path, right? Which is this part right there. I'll remove those so that you don't have to deal with that. <clears throat> Once that's all done, the last step, so we have our, we have our const router equals require, so that's our library. We have the resources controller. We have all of our routes, right? The last piece that we need is to actually export this file. And that's what we do at the bottom. We do a module.exports equals router. So those four pieces are required in order for us to have those routes. The next step is for us to register the routes with the application. This is our routes.js file where we actually register the routes. So this was a common issue with the, not the projects, but a common issue with the tests. A lot of people were just missing this one step, so I did you a complete solid it, added it in for you, made your application work, and then gave you the marks. Now the thing is, is this is so important because this is the missing piece. This is the piece that actually takes those routes that you created in the other file and actually inserts them into the application and makes them available to express. A little confusing, I can fully understand that. Um, and this actually requires three steps altogether. You have to first, register the routes in the JS file that links any external route files with our application. So we're requiring those pieces. That's under the importing the routes. The next step is to register the external route file in the routes JS. That's where we're doing the registering our routes part. And then the last piece is we create our resource routes in an external route file, which is what we did in the other file. And in this file, we have to export it from here, which becomes, we're exporting the app part. Essentially. It's a little confusing how these two pieces work, but essentially in the resource one you define the routes and in the routes.js you register the routes. Those are the two steps. I mean all my tests are open books so this should not be that big of an issue. All right, let's talk about the resource model. <clears throat> so once we actually go through this process, I have the resource model as step three, but that's not what's going to happen. When our user goes through app.js, they're going to register their uh, request object. We're going to have a request object and we're going to have a response object. And both of those are going to get passed through our routes. We're going to hit here, right? That's our next place. Where are we going after that? Where's that going to go to? Yep, to the controller. Specifically the blogs controller, right? And where is it going to go 
within the blogs controller. So it's going to go to the blogs controller. So let's take a look. We have the blogs method, right? We're using get. So let's try to remember our conventions, right? What should that be doing? Yeah, it should be doing the index, right? So it's going to call the registered index method. Right? And that's where our model is going to come into play next because in our index method, the first thing we do is go to our model, grab all of that resource into our model, and then transfer that resource to the view. Right? So that's our next step is to actually go get our resources. So let's reach out, and this is going to be the worst drawing you've ever seen in your life. That's my database. Shut your mouth. <laughs> There's our blogs. And we're going to transfer it back. So it's going to send a query. The query is going to be, I need to zoom in a little, find, right? And that is going to return back all of the associated blogs. That will return back to our index. Once the index has that information, the next place it's going to send our request to is where? The last and final part. What's that? Yep, to the views. Specifically, what's the path? Yep. Nope. Nope. What resource are we working with? Blogs. Blogs. There we go. Slash index. And we'll add the dot plug. Yeah. And it doesn't send the request there, it sends which object there? Starts with an R as well. The response. And while we're at it, why don't we write the request on these lines? Request, 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 request. All right, so to recap, our user answers in HTTPS localhost colon 4000 slash blogs. They're using the HTTP method get, right? They're not sending a form, so they're not doing a post request. They're just literally type that into the browser address bar and hit enter. That's going to navigate off to our app.js file. That's our entry point. That is defined by our package.json file, by the way. So the package.json, because I know some of you had that issue where your uh, Heroku instance wasn't working. And the reason was is because you had index.js as your entry point instead of app.js. And you had to make that change. Some of you may remember that. Um, but app.js is our entry point. It's like the equivalence to index.html or index.php in other languages. It hits that app.js. It's going to come through the app.js and make sure that it goes through all of our registered middleware. So the flash, the authenticator, blog parser, cookie parser, the session system, all of that. All of those little modules we've registered with our application, it's going to pass that request through all of those. Once it's done, the last thing it's going to do is hit our router, right? It's going to go to the routes. We pass that on to routes.js because that's where we're actually building our routes that we want to register. And then we pass that on to the routes blogs.js to actually pattern match with that path. That's going to send it off to the controller action, the blogs controller action. The controller action we're going to access, it's going to pair up with this index. It's going to go to the uh, model, get our blogs, send them back to the controller. And then the controller is going to do whatever it needs to do with that and pass it on to the views. right? And that's where it's going to finish. So let's leave that there. So let's talk about resource models. A resource model allows us to encapsulate our data logic from our application. You guys did, did anybody in this class not do MVC last semester? No? Okay. So when you talk about models, views, and controllers, right? Models encapsulate your, your data logic. That's their purpose. They encapsulate your validation, your sanitization, any normalization that you need to do, and any common data formatting that you might require, right? So like say you want full name, <laughs> that's common data formatting because you would usually store those as autonomized pieces of data first and last. 
but you would combine them as a full name. You don't rely on the database to do that, you rely on the model to do that. In addition, Mongoose, the, the um, model system that we're using, the model application we're using, provides a slew of helper methods that allow us to create a structure that adds some rigidity to an otherwise very loose database. Remember, we talked about Mongo and how it's a slutty database. It allows literally anything whatsoever. It doesn't care. It doesn't have any requirements. Mongoose takes that and makes it a little more rigid. It gives us something called a schema. The schema enforces your data to follow the schema pattern. You can think of the schema like a blueprint, right? It's like a blueprint that basically describes what attributes you're allowed to have, what data types those attributes must be, and what validation needs to apply to those attributes, right? So when it comes to actually creating a model, we need three important pieces in our model. Our model needs... Da, 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 da. It needs to import the mongoose library, obviously, because that's what we're using with it. You need to define a schema, right? And like I said, it's basically like a blueprint describing the names of the fields inside your database, the uh, any validation or sanitization that needs to happen to those fields, as well as any other attributes you want to add on, like timestamps or uh, uniqueness or something like that. We also then, when we're done, have to export the model, and that's where we actually use the uh, mongoose.model method because we export it out as that name resource. The schema, like I said, defines a blueprint of what our Mongo documents are going to look like. They define all our attributes, the data types, and any other restrictions that we may have. Our model also permits helpers in the form of helper methods. So you'll remember the couple of helper methods that we built. Um, helper methods are used once you have a retrieved record. So when you have blogs, that's when you would try to access those helper methods. Query methods are used on the model itself, and they're used when you're trying to do new queries on the model. So we created a query for our blogs called published, and we created a query on our blogs called drafts. Those were query methods. But when we did the users, right, and we did uh, authenticated, that was a helper method because we were able to take the current author that we pulled back and check to see if they're actually registered. That's a helper method. Uh, query methods can be used to perform common data filtering. For example, perhaps we only want products that match a certain color. We can use a custom query like resource schema .query by color to filter our documents to only the provided doc argument read. In addition to helper and query methods, we can also create relationships. We didn't get into this heavily. We created an author and created a reference point with the author to blogs. So um, an author can own several blogs or a blog can have one author. That's the relationship there. But we can also do something called sub documents or nested documents. And these are usually better when the data is conventionally closer to the parent in relationships um, when it only really has one relationship. So, for example, blogs, commenting, right? The comments only have any actual relationship to that blog. They are never going to, at any point in their lifespan, be tied to another blog. One comment is never going to own multiple blogs. That doesn't make sense, right? Um, so what we can actually do is take those comments and nest them directly within our blog. They'll still follow the same format. All comments will follow the same format, but it makes it a lot easier to retrieve. It makes it quicker to retrieve. There is a difference between each, and we are going to see that because we will be creating commenting once we start getting more into React. We'll create a few more resources, actually. Um, with references, we just need the object ID to create the relationship, and it's, it's really no different than when you do uh, parent-child relationships in SQL. It's basically the same idea. Yes, Mo? Just in terms of the time step that you got there, it's like, you notice that it's on its own. Oh, right here, yeah. Yeah. Whoop. How does that work? Like, is that part of the content, or is that, like, its own? Yeah, so what happens is Mongoose, right, when it takes the schema, the first argument it takes is an object that defines your attributes. So that's our title, our content, just our title and our content. So those two pieces in this first object separated right here. Right? Right. So that's the first argument. Okay? That first argument defines your attributes and any validation you're going to do, plus their data types. Right. This next argument here is any configuration that you want to do on the model. Right. 
So what Mongoose will say is, oh, you want timestamps. Cool, I'm gonna create a created at and an updated at attribute, add them to your document, and anytime you make an update to your model or create a new model, I'm gonna fill in those date fields for you. So Mongoose does that automatically? Does it automatically, yeah. Automatically. And there's other ones you can do too. You can also actually, like, for example, Mongo will create an ID field for you and immediately match up the ID field, but sometimes people don't want to use ID as the identifier. Um, I did this for you guys, actually, with your student IDs. Uh, anybody who had the test last semester, that's when I did it. Um, because I didn't want underscore ID to be your identifier, I wanted your student ID to be your unique identifier. So you can actually tell Mongoose, I want to use this as an identifier instead. And that happens in this configuration section. How would you do it in the, like, just ID? I did it in Mongoid. So <laughs> um, the way it's done in Mongoid is a little different. You basically have to say your relationship is through something. So it's a little odder. Plus it was in Ruby. Okay. So it was Ruby with Mongo. It's a little different. But I can find that out. I can find that out and send it. Um, all right. So our models are super important because they encapsulate our data. Our controllers though, our controllers are actually like the operator, the thing in the middle that kind of pieces all this wonderful stuff together. And often our controllers are gonna have a few different pieces that they require. One, our model, right? We need to put the model in there if we're gonna query it um, because we don't get wonderful things like auto loading and stuff like that in Node. Uh, you can do that type of stuff, it gets really difficult. Uh, and then the methods we want to do. So I've written one method here. We have the index method, the one that we were actually talking about. So the index method takes two arguments, but it can take three, right? And what's actually calling that, when that gets called, is this route right up here, at the top here. Uh, router.get, the first one, exactly. So that's resources controller.index. So the way callback functions work, some of you probably already remember this, so I apologize for the redundancy here, but the way callback functions work is router.get, once it does its pattern match, it's going to call this, and it's going to pass arguments to it when it calls it. And the three arguments it passes are the request, the response, and the next object. We catch those inside this function call here. So we're catching request and response. And we could catch next as well if we want to. We just don't need to because we have no use for it in here. What does next do? Next basically says, I am done with this current function that you're working with. I want you to now pass on through to the next registered middleware. Okay. So that's why we have next in flash because it says, cool, you've added the flash notification. Now pass on to the next registered middleware. The next one is the authentication check. Does the authentication checks, like cool, everything's done passes on to the next registered middleware, which is the router. And the router's like, cool, I'm gonna match this up, off you go. In here, what people will often do with the next is if it hits an error, they'll next it off to an error. So they'll do that instead. We didn't do that, we handle our errors instead of just blindly letting them go off to different locations. Um, so in this particular one, we're accessing our resource, we're doing a query called find, any of the query type stuff that you want to know is all sitting in Mongoose's documentation. Uh, then we have two steps, the then and the catch. What find actually returns back is something called a promise. We've talked about this a couple of times. Promises um, will either succeed or fail, but either way, even if they fail, they will resolve. They always finish what they're doing. So what we can do to separate whether or not it's a fail or a success is we can use a then method and a catch method. These used to be optional. You used to be able to optionally add catch. What some people would do is just use then and then catch the fail in the then. But now they're required because um, not having a catch is actually being deprecated with promises. So you have to have then and catch, which is a good pattern to get used to anyways. But basically the idea is the then will deal with the success. So as long as we get back a record and everything is golden, then we can go ahead and render and send our record back. The catch will deal with any errors that happen, so if Mongoose can't connect, or if you tried to do an explicit find and it couldn't find it, or something that basically causes it to blow up, we'll catch it, we'll catch the error, and then we'll send a flash message with our error out to our view. That's basically how that works. The reason why we render or redirect is a common question 
uh, when do I render and when do I redirect? So sometimes you redirect because it makes sense, right? So in this particular scenario, I have no resources, something's blowing up, and I decide I'm gonna redirect you off to new so you can go create a new resource, right? I have to redirect here, I'm not gonna render because I want the new logic, what's ever inside the new logic controller to actually execute its logic, right? I don't wanna to have to duplicate its logic here. So it just makes sense for me to just redirect off to that particular resource or that action. The reason why I'm rendering there is because I'm just doing a view. It's just rendering a view, that's it and it associates with index makes perfect sense. Where I won't redirect, or where I won't render and I will always redirect is under one particular HTTP method. Does anybody know what that method is? Anytime somebody uses this HTTP method, I will always redirect. Post. Post. Does anybody know why? Because the user, you don't want them to push it. And exactly. Repeat. The browser is stateless, yeah. right? However, <laughs> in a single request, that is a state. When we post, until we redirect and change state, we are in the same state. So think about it this way. I've created a user, and I don't know, I've got, I'm old, and I'm going like this, right? And I hit the damn enter button like 900 times. So I don't want 900 users to get created because of that. I want to change state, which causes anything inside that form to be gone, right? It's no longer maintained, and I only get one user. And the only way for me to do that is by redirecting so that I've changed my state and I'm somewhere else now, right? So you should always, always, always redirect, and that doesn't matter what language you're working in. Any web-based language you're working in, you should always redirect from your post, whether it's PHP, Ruby, this, Java, doesn't matter what it is, always redirect from your posts to avoid that issue. <clears throat> cool, so after all of that, the last step, the very last step is to create our wonderful views, right? And I think this also was surprisingly confusing. I know tabbing got a few of you. <laughs> um, Pug is a templating language. The idea of a templating language is to make your life easier, not harder. It's to make your life so that you can quickly write um, HTML without really having to spend a lot of time writing HTML, right? Uh, one of the biggest benefits to templating languages is inline interpolation, right? So that you get inline um, compiling of your code, like your JavaScript code. So this is cool because this creates an anchor tag, creates it with a href with this link. This gets automatically translated into the actual blog ID. This is JavaScript, right? So you have this wonderful JavaScript and your HTML all kind of linked together. I love Pug. I think Pug is super cool because it's close to a language that I use all the time called Haml. And so I find it very, very simplistic to get my head around. But it really takes understanding this tabbing, right? Because what the tabbing is basically insinuating is that this is a child of this, right? So. This is each, you can think of this as if it had a curly brace at the end of it, and then the closing curly brace was down here, but we don't need that because it's pug, right? We only need the first part of that piece. <laughs> so the good news is, we're not gonna be writing any more pug going forward. We're gonna be writing the bad news. <laughs> we're gonna be writing a new language, which is called JSX, but same idea, still just a templating language. The good news about JSX is it looks like HTML, it reads like HTML. It's basically HTML, except for you can use inline JavaScript with it. So hopefully that will make your lives a little better because I know some of you really hated this pug language. You love this stuff there. All right, so up to this point, we've been using Node.js, and it's no real different than what you've been doing in your other classes, like your ASP.NET class or your PHP class. Did you guys do Java server pages? Did you guys get into building like a Java server page app? Like where it's web-based, but it's with Java? No. Seems like a lost opportunity. It's so weird that you guys learn ASP.NET, but you work in Java so much that you don't learn Java service pages, which makes perfect sense. Anyways, um, when you guys did PHP, did you use a front-end framework? Probably not. Everything you did was in HTML, right? And then when you did ASP.NET, front-end was in HTML, right? Okay. So the cool thing about the world of JavaScript, and actually the cool thing about the thing we're going to learn, React, is that um, 
JavaScript's really big on frameworks, right? When we start working in these applications, they usually have a framework for the back and a framework for the front. So the way we were building out our application is not the most common way it's done. Usually, the way most people would develop is Node.js would be used to handle out your data, just passing the data, that's it. So it would basically be treated like an API, right? And all you would do is call the different endpoints, those routes that we created, it would return back your data as JSON, and then you would deal with it however you're gonna deal with it. And the reason why they do that is because then you're not married to a particular front end platform, right? It's not necessarily HTML. Maybe you're sending that data out to uh, the PSN network, right? And they're actually consuming that data to be able to give out user stats in a video game. That might be one purpose for it. But then you also have a front end website and you also have an app that's on somebody's phone and you also have a smart fridge application that's going on and you also have a smartwatch app. You don't need to care about the fact that what the front end is. All you need to do is maintain your data on the back end and send it out as an API call and then it can be consumed by any wide range of front end actual applications, right? Super awesome. So that's why a lot of people when they work with JavaScript, they usually adopt some sort of front end framework for their web part. So React, definitely probably one of the more popular ones. I would say React holds a good chunk of the market. Another popular one is Angular. How many of you have heard of Angular? Yeah, Angular's pretty big. Um, you usually see it in more enterprise stuff. Backbone, super old, super giant, but probably one of the first front end frameworks out there. Very difficult to learn, but Definitely powers a huge, mon a huge amount of the like uh, more enterprise systems that you see uh, that actually adopted into like JavaScript uh, front ends. There's also Vue.js, which is coming up in the ranks, and a lot of people really love Vue.js. Uh, there's Ember. There's a whole bunch of different ones that are out there, and of course, there's new ones all the time, like Next.js and Meteor and things like that, um, but they are more complete frameworks. Next.js is really good if you want a whole complete solution with a front end and a back end, uh, and Meteor is the same idea, but Meteor's major focus is using sockets for communication, which is really cool. We're going to use React because once you learn React, um, you will have at least the fundamental groundwork to basically go into any one of those other systems and at least kind of have a basic understanding because they all essentially run the same structure, the same infrastructure. So like our node system was MVC, whereas Rails is MVC, CodeIgniter is MVC, Laravel is MVC, that's a, that's a design pattern, right? MVC is a design pattern. React is component-based, where so is Angular, so is Vue, so is Ember. They're all component-based. So it's going to be a little bit of a different scenario. Some people love the component system. <laughs> Some people are like, dude, we just learned MVC. Why are we learning a whole brand new design paradigm? But the thing is, is it's not that complex. It, it, I'm making it sound worse than it is. It's not that complex. And I feel like there is a perfect marriage between those two systems, and they make sense the way they are. MVC works very well for REST systems. When you're dealing with like RESTful API systems, MVC makes the most amount of sense. When you're dealing with front end systems and each piece can be reused or you want to be able to reuse, component makes perfect sense. Its scalability is a lot better. It just, it works for a view system. So as far as I'm concerned, component makes a very good, uh, a good option or a good solution when you're dealing with a view system. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about this. So what is a component? Uh, components let you split UI elements into reusable pieces. So you remember the partials we created? Think of it like that. They're just like those partials that we created. However, it's like the partial you created if the partial had all the JavaScript you needed, all the styling, like all your CSS styling, and all of your HTML all in one location. That's what it would be like. So everything you need, almost as if that component was its own little personal application, right? That's basically what the components are. No, no, just, just playing with the hair. Just playing with the hair? Yeah, yeah. screw you. <laughs> <laughs> Data slash input is passed to components. So components are receivers. That's one thing that tends to confuse people with React. React is a unidirectional application, which means data only goes in one direction. 
that gets super confusing because when you need to be able to use something that's under the chain, you can't. You can only use things in the ancestry chain. So you have to kind of change the way you think in order to get stuff to work where you want it to work. And we're going to hit a few different problems with our React app. We're going to overcome them, and hopefully you'll get the tools you need to be able to deal with those even out in the real world. There's also a new piece that came into React just this year called Hooks that kind of changes some of this. So um, I need to actually upgrade some of my lesson plans to include Hooks, but uh, that might solve some of the problems on its own. All right. So generally what we do in order to send data to a component, we use something called props. Uh, basically, they're properties. It's an object that contains properties. Think of them like locals that we send to our views. It's almost the same kind of idea. We send props into the component. The component now has access to those props. Those props can be any data type that is available to you. So they can be an object. They can be a function definition. They can be just a standard value like a, like a string or a number or something like that. They can be whatever you want them to be. So why components instead of model view contra controller systems? So MVC is a horizontal architecture, meaning that um, each piece is basically a complete process is broken into these multiple parts. So <clears throat> instead of everything being encapsulated under one piece, we actually divide it, right? So when we have a new resource, we put it in our models folder. But all of our resource models are in the same folder. All of our resource controllers are under one folder. All of our resource views are under one folder. Right? So they're separated underneath what their actual um, component is. They're, like, they're based on that piece. Right, That's fine, but when it comes to actually scaling those systems and you're trying to scale those out, you get a little bit landlocked because now in order to scale them, you need to throw more resources out of usually hard drive space in order to build them out even more. Right, Components are vertically scalable, meaning that the component itself contains everything it requires. Because of that, you can actually take those components and throw them into systems like Lambdas, like AWS Lambdas, where they just live on their own and they can actually scale a lot better and they're a lot cheaper to scale because you don't just need to keep throwing hard drive space at it or RAM space at it, right? Um, it can exist in its own little environment and only be used when it's required. Makes it a lot easier for scalability, a lot cheaper. Both ideas promote encapsulation though. So you'll notice that I'm a big promoter of encapsulation. That's why we have so many files. That's why everything is nicely separated. It's a lot easier to maintain. Um, it also helps you kind of get an understanding of microsystems and how microsystems work, um, which will help you when you guys go out into the industry because everything's heading into microsystem systems, like um, serverless environments, essentially. Uh, my personal opinion is this. MVC is a fantastic architecture for building API-driven solutions. Works perfectly when you're dealing with REST. <coughs> it's easy to attach to various view options to it and, necessar and not necessarily care if our view is server-side generated, uh, being fed to an app, or a completely front-end separated system. We don't care, right? We just give API endpoints and let people connect to us, take the data as they need it, create new data as they need it, update data, whatever, right? We don't need to care about what they visually see at the other end as long as we're providing them some sort of JSON structure or some sort of data structure. Component-based architectures are great for single-page or completely front-end driven solutions. They can request data from our back-end using exposed route requests and maintain their encapsulation in handy, modifiable, removable components. I think the true synergy lies in using both of these separated challenges. So using component-based systems for your front-ends and using MVC for your REST-driven API systems. Makes perfect sense to separate them. Cool. So what is a front-end framework, right? Because that's what this class is, is JavaScript frameworks. So far, we've only really worked, we've kind of built our own framework at the end of the day using other frameworks as little pieces. Uh, Express is a framework, right? Mongoose is a framework. Uh, Bootstrap <laughs> is a framework. We use all those little pieces to basically build our own framework, our blogging project framework, right? But that blogging project framework, I mean, did you find it really difficult to retool it into a new project? No, because you had all the foundational pieces you needed. And that's it, right? You just take that, roll it out into a new project anytime you need to with minor updates. That's the important strength of a framework. Frameworks give you the ability to start and hit the ground running and get something prototypal up fast, right? 
That's why I love Rails, because I can literally scaffold an application in a weekend. Super fast. I love to be able to prototype quickly, because I have ADHD and can't focus on one task for a long period of time. <laughs> um, Frameworks, frameworks in general are a fantastic way to get up running quickly with little need to dive into the underlying logic to perform the common tasks. Like, just out of curiosity, how many of you in here actually opened up the Mongoose library and took a look at the underlying code? Yeah, I know. Yeah, you're full of it. <laughs> yeah, nobody did because you don't care. It works, right? That's the important piece. It works. Did you actually go into the mongoose and like see how it actually connects? No, I just had a look at it. I took a look at it. You just took a look at it? Like you opened the code, you didn't read it, you're just like, that's the code, and then closed it? <laughs> it seems good to me, I'm good. Yeah. Did you get feedback on their GitHub? I was getting data from the mongoose, that's why I Oh, right, because you were right clicking and choosing go to definition, and it was popping over? Yeah. But, or else you and that's, open it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the fact, though, is that most times when you're dealing with a framework, you're not going to really look at the underlying code. Like even with Jab, like even with Bootstrap, as much as I use Bootstrap, I don't really care how they put it together. If I need to do something, I'll override it. Right? I'm not going to actually go into the underlining CSS and try to figure out how it works because I don't care enough. Um, and that's the point of a framework. A framework should be already vetted for you. Most time frameworks are vetted by the community, which is awesome. Um, they're vetted by the uh, package management utilities that are out there. So any of the packages you're downloading from NPM, you can actually go take a look, see what their weekly downloads are, see how many you know uh, issues they currently have, the last time they posted an update, stuff like that. And you can get a quick view of whether or not you want to use this thing or not. But the cool thing is, is you hit the ground running, they've already solved the problem you're attempting to solve, right? So it makes your life a lot easier. So frameworks are super important. When it comes to a front-end framework, what React actually does for you is so ridiculous. To rebuild it would take you years, easily years, in order to rebuild what they're doing already on the front-end. Because not only are they giving you a system that deals with uh, single page application, so stuff is dynamically updating on the fly without screen refreshes. They're also dealing with transpiling your views, which means taking your JSX files and turning them into HTML. They're making your JavaScript automatically cross-platform compliant, which means your JavaScript is going to work in IE8 through up to 12, and also work in, in Chrome, Safari, Opera, Conquer, whatever tar browser you're using. <laughs> Um, they'll work everywhere, right? And that's the whole piece. Not to mention React also gives you things like VR. You can actually build VR systems in React. Really? Yep. <laughs> you can do React Native and build applications in React, all in the wonderful language of JavaScript, right? So we cannot create multi-page uh, applications in React? You can, but most times you wouldn't. Most times you'll create a single-page application. But yes, you can definitely create a multi-page application if you want to. So React Overview. React was introduced by Facebook. Facebook created React. Facebook creates a lot of things that people use in day-to-day -day development. Yeah. This is a curiosity question. Sure. Isn't it true that if your app, whatever application you create and it becomes really big, Facebook will come and say people own it? No, that is complete bullshit. <laughs> it has to be complete bullshit. Like. We use React for things. We wouldn't use React if that was the scenario. No, they can't. So React is um, an open source project that they built. They provide a front-end view, same as like Twitter built Bootstrap, right? Or but I'm saying like when, it, when your application comes no. like really, really big, like no. bigger than Facebook itself. No, they, it's an open source. It's under the new license. So no, they can't. Like they can't. It's not. I think you might be confusing it, or people might be confusing it with like Unreal. So Unreal Engine. Unity Engine and the Cry Engine are all free right now. Free. You can go ahead and build your video game in these engines. Once you release it, the second you make your first hundred thousand dollars on that video game, knock knock knock, you now have to pay for the Unreal Engine, and you have to pay licensing agreements to them, and you have to pay havoc for your physics engine. You have to pay all these different companies. They all come knocking for their handout. But that's with the video game market. React? No, it's completely open source. Use at your interest, yeah. I mean, if you really have serious issues with using a Facebook product, because I like Rich Freeman will not use it because it's Facebook, so he only teaches Angular, and that's totally cool. I, just, I support Rich, 
I don't hate Facebook that much. But <laughs> um, you can use Angular, which is open source. Okay. Right? So either one. And Angular has the same concept as React. It's component based. It used to be MVC based, which my notes state, but um, it's component based now. Yeah. Okay. And people love like it's just as easy as Angular. Yeah. React and Angular basically the same. I don't use Angular, so I might be oversimplifying it, but as far as I understand based on my buddy learning it in literally a weekend, I think it's pretty simple. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, React is not the same as Angular, though React is primarily for view logic. Angular is a complete framework that intends to be used for both the view as well as your controller and routing logic. So instead of your controller existing on the node side, it exists in the view side. And it actually handles connecting to your models and pulling the data. Um, whereas React, we're using it in a way that we're using the node side as the API. So it will handle all the regular stuff. It will handle the model and controller side. The view side, which is still technically there, um, will be sent out as a JSON response. That's it. Um, both, however, can be used in a view-centric way, where any actual data may, we may need is provided by the framework. Cool. So let's install React and actually do our first React app. So <clears throat> let's, uh, let's go to VS Code. And how do we want to do this? So is this like a whole new project yeah. yeah let's let's open up our terminals and we'll start at the root of our terminals <clears throat> now I can't remember how you create a directory it might be easier you're just in time to create your first react app are you excited Gaga kind of. kind of okay I'll wait for you to sit down all right for the rest of you uh, go ahead and create a folder somewhere however is easy for you if you want to create it in the terminal do it in the terminal if you want to do it in your file explorer, do it in your file explorer. Whatever. Right? <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to actually install our first React app. And the cool thing is, is unlike Node, where we had to create each individual file ourselves, this comes with a scaffolder. So it will actually create the files for us. So we can literally install it, run it immediately, and tell if it's working, which is great. So what we're going to type in is create dash react dash app space and the name of your react app and why not just call it my first react app or not it's totally up to you it's going to say creating a new react app it's going to install some packages it's going to install react which is like the core react dom which is the thing that will actually uh, transpile and decipher our jsx files and then React scripts, which oh, so I don't like, know what it is, but it has stuff in it that we so need. So what we said, like create React app, that's the actual like, code. That's the command. That's the command, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, I thought that was the name. And then the, the name. next thing is whatever you want to call it. Okay. Yeah. Takes a little while, made worse by the fact that there's like 25 people in here doing it all at the same time. So. What are you getting hashtag? Now, while that's happening, we are going to get a new... Package Manager. So for Node, we've been using NPM, but React is going to give us Yarn. Yarn is like NPM, but much, much better. So the big benefits of Yarn over NPM, one, you can install NPM packages with Yarn. That's totally fine. But when you install packages with NPM, it will always reinstall the package. When you call NPM install, it will always reinstall that package and all of its dependencies. Yarn is like, no dude, you already got this, you're fine. And we'll move on. So when you actually run Yarn from scratch, it's much faster than NPM. It's also smarter because sometimes package dependencies have to happen in a specific order. NPM, they're typed in that specific order. Yarn uses indexes to be able to tell what specific order they are in, so it will always guarantee they get attached in the correct order. Yarn is preferable over NPM. That being said, I use NPM more than I use Yarn. I should probably install it, but I don't. Um, but just keep in mind that they both exist. They're basically both the same thing. Why happy hacking? Uh, that's just what they say to you. Happy hacking. Can you hack with this? You can hack with any programming language. Yeah. Do you know how to hack? No, I really want to learn. You really want to learn? Yeah, I really want to so, speaking of that, there's a website 
That's yeah. really handy. Uh, there it is. OWASP.org. OWASP actually tells you about current vulnerabilities that are around and issues that might be existing, like cross-site scripting, middleware attacks, and stuff like that. But what's really cool about it is it also shows you how to do that. So you can actually test it and learn how to protect against it. But you could use OWASP to essentially learn, your, learn how to hack if you wanted to. Yeah? I ran the command and it's like yarn. Really? Yeah. Like NPM install yarn, which is super weird. <laughs> that you can install a package manager with a package manager. Not that you need it, incidentally. You can just run npm start. Not going to make a lick of difference. So whether it's npm start or yarn start, type one of those two in. I'm going to type yarn start. Couldn't find package.json file. Oh, because I'm not in the directory. I need to be in the directory. Make sure you're in the directory. <laughs> Helps. And then yarn start. So the issue was is that I had global node modules under my Sean McKinnon username, and it was using those as the modules. So I had dependency issues because they were old. Yeah. So and it couldn't update them. So I had to basically delete those. So now it's fine. Um, it's not something anybody would get as a common thing, so it's not so that that big of a deal. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about. We already talked about Yarn and what it is. Let's take a look at what the React directory is. So. If you open inside your VS Code or Sublime or whatever it is that you're working with and open up the application folder for the React app, let's, do, let's talk about this folder structure at the side. So some of this might seem familiar. You'll notice the node modules folder and you'll notice the package.json. And that's because when you're building React in development mode, right, which is what we're doing right now, all of your React stuff gets served by Node itself. So Node will actually serve your React app for you so that you can see it and interact with it and work on it. The coolest thing about React, though, is remember how we were using Node Daemon before to be able to restart every time we made a change? React does that automatically. So once it's started, any changes you make will immediately reflect in the, in the browser. So you can just literally go look. The cool thing about that as a web server is that when you make style changes in your CSS, they immediately update in the browser. So you can throw your browser on one screen, your code editor on this screen, make your style changes, and visually see what's happening right in the browser. Yeah, super, super awesome. Makes development very fast. All right, so you're going to notice you have a whole bunch of folders. The one folder you're going to be missing that's under my notes is build. You will get the build folder when you actually do a build. So why don't we do that so we can actually see what we're talking about. So let's open up our yarn, and now you'll have to disconnect. So just control C, just like we do in Node. Also, one other thing to note, say you have your Node server running on localhost 3000, and you go to boot up React, React will actually detect that it can't install, like run the server on 3000, and will switch ports automatically for you. Yeah, it makes, nice, makes it very handy. All right, so the thing we're going to run, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit, uh, bo, 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 bo. there we go, is yarn build, or npm build if you're using npm. I think it's npm install yarn, isn't it? Or you go to the yarn website and install it. That's the other option. That's fine. So what npm build does is it takes your React application and it goes through this thing called transpiling. What transpiling is, is it's when it takes like a template version of a language and it converts it into the proper version of that language. So for example, pug. All the stuff we were doing in pug gets transpiled into HTML. SAS, right? How many of you have used SAS before? Okay. Everything you do in SAS gets transpiled out to CSS. Everything you do in less, transpiled to CSS. But incidentally, when you're using ES6, which is what React supports, ES6 and ES7, in order to make it so that it works for older browsers, it will actually transpile your JavaScript 
into older browser compliant code as well. That all happens in the build, and then that build folder is what you actually deploy. And it completely runs on the front end. You can take that entire build folder and dump it on Netlify that has no server end whatsoever, and it will run. Because it's just JavaScript and HTML. That's it. Yeah. Oh, really? Because it's being treated as like a an actual Internet Explorer doesn't understand Turner's. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Well, Internet Explorer is. See, like for like I worked for Fireside with Daniel, and um, we stopped supporting Internet Explorer ten. Yeah. No, nine. Nine. I thought we did stop with ten. Internet Explorer ten. Yeah. 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 No, ten. 11. Because Internet Explorer is already a pain in the butt to deal with. It. Microsoft just really has their own idea. Like even when they released Edge, Edge was supposed to be WebKit compliant, but Microsoft's way. <laughs> like. Which isn't a hundred percent Chrome's way, or Firefox, or Safari, or Opera, or every other browser on the planet. It's the Microsoft way, right? And it's so annoying. They think they're trendsetters, but nobody uses their application. Like <laughs> it's like we use it to download Chrome. That is all we use it for. And as soon as Chrome is on the system, well, we can't delete it because you've removed that ability. So, yeah, whatever. Anyway, so build will actually wind up creating static files. So if we go back to our editor, you'll have a build folder now. And if you open up the build folder, you'll see that you have a service worker JS file. You have a pre-cache manifest. You have a manifest JSON. So basically what those files do is they tell the browser, these files have, are this static asset and they expire at this point. That's essentially what they're for. So the browser won't, uh, the browser will cache them and then when they expire, it will re pull them. Yarn.lock is our yarn file. So you might have, if you don't have yarn, you'll have a package.json.lock. It's basically, if you look at your package.json file, here's your dependencies, right? You can see this, you can see the dependencies you're using React, React DOM, and React scripts. But if you look at your package.json lock or your yarn lock, you can see all the dependencies that those dependencies have as dependencies. How's that for confusing wordage? Right? All right, so under build, you'll, you'll get all of these pieces, but the main site is under static. You'll notice you have three different fields. You have media, which is our wonderful logo in SVG. You have JavaScript, which I mean isn't exactly readable at this point because it chunks it and builds map files so it can figure them out. It uglifies them. That's literally the word. It uglifies them. And then you have static CSS files, which are also semi-uglified. Right? And a map to help decipher the uglification. So this is not human-readable stuff, obviously. But it works fine. And you also get this wonderful index.html. If you were to navigate to this folder in your Chrome browser right now, it would work. No problem because it doesn't require a node server to work. We use the node server when we're doing our development. That's the purpose. That's why we're running React in this way, is because we can actually go ahead and develop, automatically get real-time look of what our application is doing, works just like a server, and then when we're ready to finally deploy the front end, we deploy it by doing a build and then deploy, which gives us a nice reduced application. I think in the semester I taught this, I didn't do built. We actually just deployed directly to Heroku, and it just ran, and we just ran it as two separate servers. I think this semester we'll build, because it just makes, it's what the normal steps are, right? All right, cool. Let's talk about the rest of the folders. So that's where your build will go. No modules folder, you know that's where all your dependent libraries go. You have your public library. This is where all of your um, public facing assets go, so like your favicon, your entry page, which is your index.html, which looks like this, and your manifest JSON file, which tells it which files to cache. Then you have your source file, and this is where our application is going to live. All the app files we build for React are going to be in our source file. So this will be source folder, sorry. So this is where we'll live most of the time. 
is inside this source folder. So, like I was saying before, the templating language we'll be using is called JSX. And <coughs> the unfortunate part to that is the files don't end in JSX. They end in JS, which can be a little confusing, but that's just the way it is. If you click on a JS file, it looks like this, right? Uh, but you can type actual HTML right in the JavaScript folder, and it will be interpreted by the transpiler. That's how it works. Now, it's possible that your code editor is freaking out because it doesn't know what this is. And if down here you don't have Babel JavaScript, try clicking on it and see if it's listed. If it's listed, choose it as your option. If it isn't listed, you will have to install it as an extension, which will give you the syntax highlighting for Babel. Okay? But you want Babel JavaScript so that you can work with JSX files. You can work with them anyways, it just gives you nicer highlighting. As you can see, I've got pretty highlighting. This test file, as much as I would absolutely love to teach testing, we don't have the time, unfortunately. So I'm not going to teach you how to test these files. That being said, it's something that you can definitely learn in about the span of a weekend by taking a look at Jest. Jest.js is a really handy test suite. It's very simple to use. Uh, Mocha is another one, but I would recommend Jest. It's a lot easier to learn. But that's how you would do test-driven development if you were going to do it. The cool thing about React, though, is when you do React test, it will, or sorry, you run yarn test, it will run these test files automatically for you. So you just have to make sure it's like your component name dot test dot js, and then it will run those test files for you. So, cool. Let's do things. We are going to create a very simple hello world in JSX. And we're just going to do it right in the app JS file that we have here. So here's our app.js. Let's just take everything that's inside this return and delete it so that you only have the return. It looks like that. Okay. And then, uh, actually, how am I doing this? Oh, we're using React on? Hold on. Maybe we'll just skip to the thing. I think we're just going to skip to the thing. Yeah, all right. We're going to try some concepts here. OK. <clears throat> just close out JS. Don't save it. All right. We're going to create our first component, but what time are we at? 610. Cool, we got tons of time. All right, JSX, which is like our index.js file or our app.js file. JSX is just another templating language, like I said. It's XML based, but as you can see, it looks like HTML. It allows us to just run HTML inline, which is super, super handy. Um, I have an example online of it in a much better view right here. No, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. I find when you zoom in, like everything just moves about. All right, so here's our Hello World app built with JSX. So this is a component that's built. And as you can see, we have a variable defined at the top, right? Just regular JavaScript have another variable here, but you'll notice that our HTML is not in a string format. Our HTML is written as just raw HTML. The cool thing is though, is we can inline JavaScript right in here. So what is the result of this sentence here? Does anybody know? Hello world, exactly, because recipient is coming from this variable and it's being output using these curly braces. So curly braces in JSX represent this thing inside here is a JavaScript expression. So evaluated as a JavaScript expression. 
React DOM render, what its purpose is for is to render our actual React component. So that's what this is doing. This is rendering our component. We've created this and now we're rendering it. It takes two arguments. It takes the component you want to render and where you want to render it to. We're not going to use get element ID. Does anybody have a random guess of what we're probably going to use? What's the other one? Uh, Query selector. Yes, that's that exactly one. it. Cool. We already did our yarn build. So let's create a new component. So components are reusable UI pieces. As I was saying, it's a, it's a view, but everything you need is contained in it. Your CSS, your JavaScript, and your HTML is all contained in one piece. A lot of times people will use inline CSS and everything will be just in the one component file. There won't be separated files. So that one file will represent the whole component. All your CSS, all your HTML, and all your JavaScript in one file. It's kind of easy. We can write components using two different syntaxes. Actually, we can write it using three now due to hooks. But one is to use the function syntax like this, where we do function, the name of the component, and then we return out our HTML or whatever it is we want. Or we can use class syntax. I kind of like class syntax. I like the way it looks. But that being said, I haven't di dived into hooks yet. Once I dive into hooks, that might be the way we go. But I do like class structure. I think class structure is kind of neat. The above, both of these, are the equivalent. They're the exact same thing. It is. Sometimes you want classes, though, when you're dealing with constructors. So if you want to create a constructor action, you need to use classes. And often when we're trying to create a state, we have to use classes. However, hooks changes that. Hooks makes it so that you can use functions, but still have state. So that's why I need to investigate a little bit over this weekend. Um, okay, so the above is equivalent. However, classes have some additional features that the function syntax does not. So let's try out these concepts. So we're actually going to delete all the files currently inside our source directory. So open up your source directory, click on the first one, go all the way down to service worker, right click and delete all those files in the source directory. So it should be empty. Once you've done that, you're gonna create a new file. Here, that's something you can use, Mo. This is my life hack. <laughs> All right. So you can create a new file under the source called index.js. Works pretty good, eh? It does. Yeah, it really surprisingly. Does. Yeah. It's like four dollars worth of stuff it's a four dollar battery from the dollar store and a one dollar fan from the dollar store Smart. Works. Smart. lasts like six hours and it's, actually and it's pretty powerful yeah. not bad life hack <laughs> all right first thing we need to do with any react component is import react so we're going to import react from react yeah we get to learn another new syntax this import statement is actually a thing in JavaScript. It's a real legitimate thing that exists in JavaScript. So uh, import and exports were introduced in ES6, and React takes full support of that and utilizes them. So it's not like something you have to go to the React documentation to see. You can actually go to MDN and see imports and exports and use them today if you wanted to. They're kind of handy. You can kind of think of them like require and node. It's almost exactly the same thing. Uh, we also need to import the React DOM. And something tells me that's not necessary anymore, but I will clarify that on the weekend. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to write our components using function syntax, and they're literally just functions. So we'll just write a function called welcome. Common syntax is to capitalize them. So there's my welcome function. 
And like a good little function, it's going to return something. It's going to return a thing that I'm going to encapsulate inside a set of parentheses. And the thing I'm going to encapsulate in my parentheses is my HTML. Oh, see that? See how it blew apart like that? That is due to prettier. Prettier is breaking my stuff. Do I have JSX? There. Well, now it doesn't do it, but now I don't get nice. What about React? There we go. Nice. That works better. <laughs> No, it doesn't explode. So that's our wonderful component for welcome. Now we're going to create another component. This is going to be our app component. And our app component is going to serve our welcome component for us. So we're going to create a function called app. <laughs> it's funny how you learn things. Yeah, this is completely pointless. Don't do that. Let's just serve the welcome component. So we're going to do React DOM. It's going to render our component. React DOM takes two arguments. The first argument is the name of the component you want to render. So what's the name of our component? Right? And we write it in a enclosed HTML tag. So that looks like this. You've probably seen these before. They look like that. So they have like a closing brace at the end of it, or the forward slash at the end of it. Self-closing. Self yeah, self-closing HTML tag. Yeah, it's not really a thing anymore, is it? I don't know if it's a thing in this. Um, I think it is. I don't think you can get rid of the slash. Uh, and then we need to tell it where we want to put it. So we're going to do document dot query selector and we're going to say hashtag root hashtag root trending on twitter not funny sorry i feel like i could get kardashians to do html just because of the hashtags they totally adopt it Imagine Kim Kardashian making websites. Like, yeah. Booty.com. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> All right. Now, you might be asking, where's that coming from? Where's it coming from? Where, what's hashtag root? Like, did you just make that up on the spot? No, nope. The yes. Under the public folder, you have this file called index.html in here. Think of this like the layout file inside our Node.js. Remember the layout file we created for Pug? It's essentially that. It's the layout file. And if you scroll down, you will see this wonderful div right here. Div ID equals root. What's happening is the index.js file, when it goes to render, it's going to spit our application into that location for us. So it will take our component and dump it right directly into there for us. You can. Some people do. You can code it in HTML, but you, then you lose JSX. You can't do any JSX there because it doesn't transpile from that location. The whole idea is to take that as a component and okay. treat it as a little component. And yeah. Awesome. Yes. The uh, so when it's <laughs> behind the scenes, there's a build system that actually connects all the components for you. So it will go through, take the contents of your source folder, automatically transpile them, connect them up, link them up as they need to be linked, and then spit them out as one massive file. Yeah, it just does it on its own. Now, there are times where you want to modify what it does with the build, and that's when you actually have to do um, what's called eject, and then you get the webpack folder, and you have to actually modify your webpack stuff. It's really confusing. It can be very, very difficult to deal with, but you can do it. 
And to, to, to fire it off, it's just npm eject or yarn eject, and you'll see the webpack file. You can start manipulating it. Otherwise, you just let it do its thing. Yeah. All right, so that's where that's going to show up. So now if we go to our thing and type in yarn start and hit enter, starting our development server, loading our web page, and we get hello world. Yay yeah, us! Do you get anything? <laughs> Pepcacker. <laughs> okay. All right. So in the above file, in here, we created a component and we rendered it with React DOM. Now, the reason why I was starting to type in function app is because usually we want to keep our components nice and separated in their own little individual files, right? And then we bring them in to our app file and then serve out our app file. That's usually the common flow for how we do this. Um, so that's why I had it with the function app. But before we get into all that, let's talk about props. Props, or properties, obviously, are a way for us to pass data and functionality to a component, this thing that's currently highlighted as a component. Uh, in our example, we are splitting out hello world, but if we wanted to make it more flexible, so we could say hello Dave or whatever, uh, we could actually provide a prop to our welcome component, and then the prop can then easily use to output the dynamic data. So the way we do that, we add an argument, prop or whatever you want to call it. It's just, at the end of the day, it's just an argument. And then we want to change world out for prop. And the way we do that is we use these wonderful curly braces and we do prop dot name. So prop will be an object, just like the locals that we used in Node. Object will, or prop will be an object, and that object can contain many, many variables, as many as you want, many keys, right? And you can access the values in those keys by just accessing the key. So now, when we do the welcome, like we have here where it says welcome, we can actually add an attribute, just like an, HTF, or an HTML attribute. I don't know where I was getting HTF from. It's a long week. We go name equals... I'm going to write Sean. And what will happen is this attribute will become immediately a key of prop and be available to us within our, our, within our component. Sorry, can you explain the dot name? Sure. Why name? Can we just put a prop and then put prop? No. So prop is an object. What happens is when React goes ahead and compresses these all up, like transpiles them all, it's going to take all the attributes that are currently inside here and immediately make them properties of the prop. So name will become a property. So say I want to add more than that. Uh, name, uh, location equals here right now. Okay. When React goes ahead and transpiles that, Name and location will both be properties of prop. So let's finish this off. Welcome to um, location. Oh, sorry, I do. I do need prop.location. My apologies. Yeah. Yeah. Because they become properties on the prop object. You don't even have to call this prop. We could call this mo. You can call it whatever you want. Yeah. It's just, it's a variable to hold an object. That's all it is. Just common naming convention in this prop. Most people use prop. So now if we open up our browser, you'll notice it's already updated. You didn't have to refresh. Why is the text so small? It's super small. Need senior size. There we go, 400%. Welcome to here right now. Cool. What's that? 
yeah, the, the grammar is absolutely atrocious, but whatever. Okay. Uh, when we add an attribute to component, so attributes, think of HTML attributes, right? So think of like href on anchor tags and um, what else? IDs and class and all of those. Those all become keys to the prop. So if you have a href on an anchor tag, it will become a key in the prop. And you can actually utilize it from that point. So all tags, like all, sorry, not tags, all attributes will become keys of prop and available to you inside your component to play around with. So in addition to props, we also have something called state. And state is super important. The biggest difference between a functional component, like we draw in here, versus a class component, like we're about to change to, is class components have the ability to create state. The idea of state will allow us to basically bind a component, bind a value to a component, and then transfer it through the, and through the children of that component. So if that component has children that it relates to, you can actually pass the state down through those. Because remember, it's unidirectional. I think this is better demonstrated in an example, as I just wrote here. We're going to change welcome to a class. So why don't we just comment this guy out so we have it. Oh, that's not commenting. How do you do commenting? Hopefully that's commenting. That might not be, actually. Uh, is it not commenting? We'll find out. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're going to write class. Welcome, not weklum. Welcome. And that's going to extend the react dot component. And a set of curly braces. And we're going to render return. And let's just copy this stuff from in here. Might as well. And take off these things. Ah, stop that. Got to get rid of these things now. Delete. 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 Now, interestingly enough, in the functional definition, we had to provide an argument called prop. In the class component, there's already an argument called prop. It already exists, but in order to access it, we just have to prefix these with this. Is it props with an S? Yes, it is. Sorry, it's props uh, with an S. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, this dot props. The class automatically gets it from its extended class. Oh, okay. So it's getting it from its parent. But well, like it doesn't have to be props, is it? It has to be props. Because that's it's defined in React component. Oh, okay. Yeah. We don't actually get to rename this. We can't call this dot mode this time. So that's this dot props. Yeah, this dot props. So what happens in this scenario is React component will instantiate. When it instantiates, it's going to grab these two pieces and turn them into properties of the props property. And then that becomes available to um, welcome because it's extending React component. So it has access to this.props because this.props is defined by this guy. So it's a property of React component. Think of it like in Java when you guys set attributes. Or do you call them attributes or fields? What do you call them? Static values that are inside your class. Fields? Yeah. So when you set fields, it's the same idea. Props is a field of React component. It was set. Cool. Yeah, and C++ are called properties as well. Actually, they're called data members. Yeah. There's data members and data methods. Yeah. Um, all right, so... Okay, cool. So we have our class, 
And we can pass that, so let's just make sure everything is still working. So if you jump back over, yep, still says, hello, Sean, welcome to here right now. Everything is good except for Mo got an error. And he knows why. All right, now we're going to change this out from prop to state and actually use state instead of props this time. So in order to do that, we have to actually create a constructor because we have to create the state object at the time we initialize the component. The cool thing about it, though, is the components initialize the second you use them. You don't actually have to call new like you would normally when you create a class. So we're going to create a component, uh, sorry, a constructor. So we just define it as constructor like so. <clears throat> and just so you're aware, these this class that we're building here, minus this weird HTML in here, is the way JavaScript classes are created. So you can actually use JavaScript classes, especially if you're one of those people that really hated prototyping. <laughs> if you really, really hated prototyping, classes are for you. All right, so under the constructor, we're going to create an argument called props. Put it in there. And we want to make sure props gets passed to the React component, so we're going to do super props. Super will basically call React components constructor and pass it this argument. And now we're ready to set our state. So we're going to do this dot state is equal to an empty object. And that object is going to have whatever properties I want, but I'm going to make them the same as my props. Props.name. Now, incidentally, what Mo was asking before about whether or not this has to be this.props, it does if you're using just props and just React component. But when you're using state, you are essentially changing the name of the argument that props uses to get set. So you could change props to Mo there. That could be Mo, that could be Mo, and that could be Mo. That, that's totally fine. But if you're not using a constructor, you have to use props. That's the way it goes. So when you use Mo in the constructor, then that will change the... Yeah, so I could do... do, do. There we go, Mo rocks. Of course, of course, and everything stays the same. Do, but... Common convention is to keep the name props. So that's what you'll likely see. I like try to stay with common convention so that way when you're on the internet wilds and you're looking at tutorials and stuff, they kind of align a little bit. <laughs> Makes it a little simpler for you. All right, cool. Now that we have state, we can actually use state within our React component and change these out to the state itself. So to do that, we're going to change these two from props to state but we're also going to need to add another state property called location, which I didn't do. And we'll just put location in here. There we go. So it might feel like, well, this is kind of redundant. We're really just doing the same thing with props. Now we're just going through an extra step for no reason. But state's super important because state is how we can actually pass information from one component to another. We can't do that using props. We have to use state in order to pass the information from a component to another component. So that's where state comes in super handy. Let's see here. Uh, okay, so what we're going to do using state, we're going to create an on change function actually to kind of demonstrate this. So under your p tag, we're going to create an input, not m input, input, like so. We're going to give it an on change function. Okay. And this is going to be kind of lengthy, just to give you an idea. But it's going to be function. event. So this is a callback that will be used. So we're just giving it the function definition. This dot set state. Set state is a 
method that comes from the React component. That takes an argument of an object, and we're going to say name e or sorry event dot target event dot target dot value. So that's coming from the thing. And then we have to bind this. So dot bind this, which will bind our class with it. Oh wow, that's kind of cool. I like the way that separated it. That makes it a little easier to read. <laughs> I haven't written this since 2017. These notes come from 2017. And I'm reading it now going, why would I do this? Like, this is the worst thing in the world. And then I read further on. Now that you've done that, we're going to change it to a shorter hand version. <laughs> so that's the long way. <laughs> Let's change that to the much shorter way. I'm sorry, Mo. What do you want for free? All right. This, this, you guys recognize this. Nice arrow function, right? Much better. Much easier to read. There you go. <laughs> That's much better. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Cool things are going to happen. Very, very cool things are going to happen. All right, if you want to go ahead and duplicate that line, we'll do location as well. Probably wouldn't hurt to have some labels in here because it's going to be very difficult to read. What? Why are you thanking me? Oh, you're very welcome. There we go. Now at least we know what those things are. can't stand it up though because it wanders it starts turning all right I think this should work I do have it that we need to add value on this but I don't think we do uh, hold on let me read this oh yeah no we definitely do otherwise it won't work all right we need the value so it's just value equals this dot state dot name and then on the other one value equals this dot state dot location there we go and then it splits them all up <laughs> it's the length thing you might not need that I'm not sure yeah it would fill it in the first time that's all it is yeah that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Right. That makes sense. All right. If you jump over to your thing, right now I have name Sean and location here right now. So I'm going to say Daniel Barry Ontario. Notice it changes as you do it. No. Uh, Wisconsin. I think I spelt it wrong. You definitely did. 
It's the English in me. It's Carlson. <laughs> cool. All right. So that's literally all I have for today. And even with our big break, we still ended at 645, which is great. So we're going to take this stuff. And next week, we're going to start building our client side to our node application. We're going to do it in very nice little baby steps where the first piece will be to take our views and translate them into JSX. Then the next step will be to sync up to our database. So we'll, next week we'll do home, about, and contact. And we'll actually create an about and contact page because we currently don't have one.